Hello, Clinic Review family. It's so good to see you. I hope you're having a great day. I'm sorry I'm a little late with posting this video. Uh, I bought some new toys for my kid, my grandkids. And have you ever tried to put together kids' toys and it takes you five times as long as you think it's going to? So I had thought they were going to come to sort of put together already. And I opened the box and I'm like, I have to do it all. So then I put it all together and I'm just getting ready to put the two parts together. And I did them completely the opposite way. So then I had to take it all apart and do it all again. Anyway, I'm sure you all have had that experience. Some of you have had. So thank you for to all of our channel members. And if you're interested in taking a NCLEX review, we have on-demand online uh, clinic review. You can go to clinicreviews.com, the website, not the YouTube channel, and you can get information about that. So I'm kind of excited to do vital signs today. It doesn't sound that exciting, but I'm sort of uh, geeky in that I like um, understanding how things work. And so that's sort of what I'm going to do with you today. It's um, vital signs obviously are not super complicated, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the control, particularly of temperature. So anyway, um, it is important that you know the range of normal temperature because you're not going to say it's a fever until it's over 100.4. Um, if it's over 100.4, that's pyrexia. That means a fever. If it's over 104, that's hyperpyrexia, which is a dangerously high fever, particularly for older adults. They can start to become delusional when their uh, body temperature gets over 104. Heart rate for adults is 60 to 100. If you don't know the vital signs for kids, y'all, I did... Um, I did vital signs for kids. I did in August, this past August, August of 23, I did a bunch of peds videos and there's one there that talks about vital signs for kids. So these are adult ranges, respiratory rate, 12 to 20 systolic blood pressure. Y'all is less than 120 and diastolic is less than 80. So if it's 120 to 139, that's called prehypertension. So we want to keep blood pressures less than 120 over 80. And then hypertension is uh, over 140 and or over 90. Only one has to be over the number to be considered either prehypertension or hypertension. So those are the normal values. Uh, oh, just a reminder, if the cuff is too small, uh, then it's going to be falsely high reading. If the cuff is too big, it's going to be a falsely low reading on that blood pressure. Uh, other things. So now I'm going to get into a little bit about temperature. So circadian rhythms, um, the lowest temperature is early in the morning, sometime between like two and six usually. And you can see here the time of day, zero. Um, if you look along that lower line, it says zero, three, that's a.m., 9 a.m., 12, noon, 1500, 1800, et cetera. So you can see the lowest body temperature is somewhere between three and six. And the highest body temperature is somewhere around five or six in the evening. And so that's very common, y'all. Now, that doesn't mean the body temperature should, should go over 100.4. That's not what it means. It, and, and you don't want it to go, you know, too low. But you're going to see this normal increase in body temperature as the day progresses. And it's going to lower uh, over the course of the night. Now, ovulation also affects body temperature. So let me show you how this, this works. So um, if you can see this, there are, it says up at the top, it says July, and then it gives a date. And then it says August. Now look along the bottom. It's got that little purple line. That's, that's when the woman is menstruating. So it's having their period. And then you can see day one, two, three, four, five. So that's up at the top again, day one, two, three, four, five. So for this person, uh, she menstruated for the first five days. So the, the cycle starts on day one of menstruation. That's when the cycle always starts. Okay. And, uh, ovulation occurs around day 14. So you can see that, uh, menstruation started on day one and menstruation occurred for the first five days. Now this is, if someone wants to measure their temperature to see when they're most fertile, she will know she's most fertile when her te body temperature goes up. So she starts checking her temperature on um, day six. She's done uh, menstruating. And you can see it kind of fluctuates there normally. And then it drops on day 
uh, let's see what day is that? That's day 14. It drops and then it jumps up on day 15 and is also still high on day 16. So when it drops like that on day 14, she knows she's going to ovulate the next day. So the next day, then on the 15th, when it goes up like that, she knows that she's ovulating. Okay. So that's just sort of a an interesting thing. And this is the, what we could, when we talk about the rhythm method of birth control, the rhythm method of birth control has to do with monitoring for a woman to monitoring um, her cervical uh, discharge and also her body temperature. And then of either avoiding intercourse when she knows she's most fertile or uh, having intercourse when she knows she's most fertile, depending on if she wants to get pregnant or not. So I just think that's, that's interesting. And you can get an NCLEX question about that. Now, this is also interesting to me. This is just related to temperature control. So our body has a set point. So if you see that little dotted line, it's kind of a green dotted line. It's at the top. It's a set point suddenly raised to a higher value. So this person is running along, say, at 98.6. Okay. And then all of a sudden, their, their body temperature starts to go up, but the body temperature is set at 98.6. So anytime the body temperature raises over 98.6, they're going to have, uh, the immune system is going to be stimulated. So they have chills, vasoconstriction, piloerection, epinephrine secretion, and shivering. So they don't feel good, right? They have, they have general malaise and they're, they feel chilled and, and they feel bad, right? And it takes um, it takes a couple days for that body to reset the body temperature. Could take, uh, it could take a day, right? So it, it can happen pretty quick, but it doesn't happen like, like that. But it could take 24 to 48 hours. So what happens is if someone gets a fever, they're going to feel terrible, right? And a lot of times we take medication to bring our fever down, like acetaminophen or ibuprofen. We take something to bring it down so we don't feel so bad. But if you don't take anything and the temperature goes up and then it kind of stays up, the body is going to reset it. So even though the body temperature stays high, you no longer are shivering and feel chilled. You just feel like warm now. Okay. And so the body actually resets. And so what happens is then they get over they, their, their bacterial um, number of bacteria either goes down or the, the immune system is able to take care of the virus, whatever it is. And the, and the body temperature starts to go down. And so then it resets it down to a lower level. And then you see um, sweating with that. So I just think that's interesting. I don't think you're going to get any test questions on that. I just, I don't think I'd ever really understood this idea of the body resetting its body temperature. So our body likes to be at a certain temperature, whatever that uh, whatever that body, you know, temperature is. And we're all different a little bit. The, and the body temperature tends to reset down a little bit as we age. So, uh, kids' body temperatures tend to be a little higher probably because their met metabolic rate is higher. And as we age and our metabolic rate goes down, think of metabolic rate, like, um, like an engine running. So if the engine is vroom, 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 right, that's a high metabolic rate and you can get a really warm, engine, like you put your hand on the, on the, the engine, you go, well, that's really warm, or it's just barely idling, right? It's a lower, uh, metabolic rate and it's not nearly so warm. So that's the same thing. When your metabolic rate is, is higher, your body temperature is higher. When your metabolic rate is lower, your body temperature is lower. All right. Then hypothermia, mild hypothermia, this surprised me 90 to 95 Fahrenheit, moderate hypothermia is 82 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit and severe hypothermia is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so it's sort of interesting that if someone comes in severely or moderately hypothermic and you can't get a pulse, you cannot declare them dead until you've warmed them up because a cooling body temperature slows everything down. That's why there are some people, sometimes they, their body almost completely shuts down, but then when you warm them up, they actually revive and actually they're, they're doing okay. Um, and so if somebody comes in extremely hypothermic, you have to warm them up before you can say that they're dead, even if you can't really get it much activity um, while they're hypothermic. And then critically ill patients need to have continuous rectal temperatures done. You, it's the, it's the most accurate form 
of getting a, a temperature and because you never know if somebody's like can't keep their lips sealed or maybe their skin is cooler. Uh, there's different reasons why. Um, and I mean, you can use oral oral and tympanic temperatures if you know, you don't have to question the results of oral or tympanic temperatures. But if it's a, I'm talking clinically, um, if it's a if it's a clinically or critically ill patient, you're going to be expected to do rectal temperatures. And then uh, it's not really a vital sign, but normal SpO2, O2 sat is 93% and above. Now, a lot of the books you read will tell you 95% or above, but I'm telling you clinically and on the NCLEX, uh, we say 93% or above. Okay, so we, we don't insist people have to be 95. They have to be 93% or above. Now, this to me is, is really interesting. And if you can understand it, it is going to help you with some questions you could get on the NCLEX, okay? So this is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So along the, uh, I think it's the y-axis. I'm never, I don't ever remember what's going up and down, but the, the axis is going up and down is saturation, oxygen saturation, it's a percentage. And then the line that's going along the bottom is oxygen tension, but it's, it's really mil the pressure, partial pressure of oxygen. When do you see the partial pressure of oxygen? Well, you see it in the ABGs. So when you draw ABGs, you get the PaO2. That's the partial pressure of oxygen in the artery, right? At art arterial blood gas. So you get a, a, a pressure of oxygen. And what I want you to see is that the pressure of oxygen, the PaO2, it's very clearly relates to saturation. So if oxygen tension because it, it can be higher than hundred. It's not a percentage, right? The PaO2 is uh, not a, not a percentage. It's a pressure. So the pressure can go over hundred, but we don't want it to go over hundred because if it goes over hundred, then that's a lot of pressure against the alveolar wall and it can actually do lung damage. So we really don't want it to be over hundred unless they're so severely sick. And we have to increase those pressures so much just to get oxygen into the lungs, but we don't want to do that for very long. Like preterm, preterm babies, we may have to, um, increase that pressure a little bit. It can cause damage though. We don't like to do it. So uh, normal is 80 to hundred. So if you look at the oxygen tension and then in that middle curve is what we call the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. It's the middle curve that we're looking at. So if you take go up with that blue line and then across, what you see is that when the partial pressure of oxygen is hundred, if you look at that middle curve, you can see that the oxygen saturation is going to be over 95%. Now, if the partial pressure of oxygen is 80, if you look at that orange line, the partial pressure of oxygen is 80, it doesn't change that much. It's still 95%, right? Because that oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is has that plateau. So as long as the as long as you're within that plateau, then your your percentage, even though your PaO2 changes, the saturation doesn't change. Now, the reason it's called dis oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve is because this is the rate at which the hemoglobin loses the oxygen to the cells. So the hemoglobin carries the oxygen to the cells and then releases it. And so we know that as long as the tension is between 80 and 100, when that hemoglobin gets to the tissues, it's going to release 95 plus percent into the tissues, which is why we have that saturation level. Now, what happens when it gets down to 60? Because 60 is considered uh, very quite low. It's the, the lowest you want it to be without like really critically being concerned, like we got to intubate this patient, right? So if it drops to 60, you can see it's going to be 91, 92%. Do you see why we're concerned about oxygen saturations that are 90 below 93%? Because it's you're on the edge of that cliff. Look at that cliff. If you look at that middle, that middle curve line, it, you've got the plateau. So you've got some room to play, right? The PaO2 can be anywhere between 80 and 100. It can even get down to like 70, 65. But when it gets down to 60, your O2 sat is now 91, 92%. And it's like, we're now on the edge of the curve. So that's why I'm telling you that the SAO2, the saturation P, uh, of oxygen, that the one where you put on the finger with the red light, 
if it's under 93%, y'all, what you say to yourself is the PAO, the, the PAO2 is dropping. I'm on the edge of that cliff. I need to take action. That cliff is that I don't want my patient on the edge of the cliff. If you have a, a two-year-old and you're walking in the Grand Canyon, you're not going to let your, your two-year-old get close to the edge of the cliff. You're keeping them back from the edge of the cliff, right? If they even get close, you're like, get back here. I'm not letting you get close. So that's why you're concerned. And then if you get down here to 40, you can see now my O2 sat is in the 70s. So you've got to be able to understand. So if you when you have a patient whose O2 sat drops to 90, 89, 90%, and it's it's unexpected, right? It it was fine before. Now all of a sudden it's dropping. You know what you can do? You can ask for a set of ABGs. Ask for some ABGs and see what's going on with their their PAO2. Their, their PAO2 may be dropping, in which case we may need to be a little bit more aggressive with the oxygen. Okay, so that's the oxy hemoglobin dissociation curve. Now, what I want to show you is you can have what's called a left shift. The left shift is that, that line on the left. So the middle line, the middle line is the one that's normal, and then it can shift to the left. Now, what causes it, the line to shift to the left? Well, a lower body temperature, so hypothermia, a high pH alkalosis, or a low CO2. Uh, uh, so that would be like tachypnea, they're breathing fast and blowing off too much CO2. So, so let's just talk mostly though about a lower body temp, hypothermia, or alkalosis. So what happens is you can see now when it's at 100, okay, the, uh, the tension is 100, we're still about the same, right? We're like 99%. If we go down to 80, we're still the same, 98, 99%. But if we go down to 60, see before when we went to 60, it would be 91%. Now it's like 95, 96%. And at 40, you're down to 91, 92%. So what this is, is what this tells you is that the tissues, when, when you have a lower body temp or alkalotic, the tissues are demanding less oxygen. Remember I told you, you have to warm a patient up before you can say they're dead. Do you know why you have to warm a patient up before you can say they're dead? Because the bodies aren't demanding a lot of oxygen when the body temperature is so low. And so you need to get that metabolic rate up. So you're like, okay, it, when they start demanding oxygen, is everything going to go back, right? So we need to see that. So like if your patient comes back from the OR and their body temperature is quite low, you got to get them warmed up so you can see what's really going on. They may come back from the OR and have a 98% O2 sat, but you're not quite sure really what that means because they probably have this shift to the left or if they become alkalotic and you go, well, their O2 sat is fine. Well, if their O2 sat is fine, I wouldn't put much store in that if they're alkalotic or hypothermic. I'd be like, we got to get this fixed and see what's really going on here because this it's, it's, changing these numbers. Now, they can also have a right shift, a higher temp, so hyperthermia, pyrexia, or a lower pH, acidosis. So when the body temperature goes up, that's a higher metabolic rate, isn't it? It's demanding more oxygen. And so the hemoglobin releases the oxygen more easily into the tissue. So when you're at 100 millimeters of mercury, you're at 95%, so you're still okay. But look what happens when you go down to 80. Now you're down to 91%. And then you go to 60, all of a sudden you're down to 81, 82%. If you go to 40, you're in the 60s. So you've got to understand if your patient's body temperature is very high, their O2 sat may actually drop because it's demanding more oxygen. This is a very interesting to think thing to think about with COVID. How many of you took care of patients during COVID and you had trouble keeping their O2 sat up? Do you remember how we did not make decisions about intubating people based on their O2 sat? We made decisions about intubating people based on their ABGs because their O2 sat was not reliable when their body temperature was so high. So if you have a patient whose body temperature is 102, 103, and their O2 sat is 88%, you're like, okay. And normally it's like, fine, right? 95, 96, 97. You're like, well, I mean, their they their PAO two may still be fine. Let's get let's get an ABG and see what's going on. I mean, we can obviously give them more oxygen because their body's demanding more oxygen. So let's get it up closer to the hundred uh, millimeter mercury range, right? Let's let's give them more oxygen to do that. But what I'm saying is the reason their O2 sat is low is because they're highly they're in a high metabolic state and the tissues are demanding lots of oxygen. So I just think this is super interesting. Um, 
Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Okay, we've got, I think, five questions to do today. 52-year-old woman is admitted with pneumonia, dyspnea, and discomfort in her chest, left chest, when taking deep breaths. She has smoked for 35 years and recently lost 10 pounds. She's starting on IV antibiotics, high protein shakes, and two liters O2. Her vital signs at the start of treatment are temp 100.2, Fahrenheit tympanic, heart rate 112, respiratory rate 22, BP 138 over 86, and oxygen saturation 92%. Which of the vital signs taken four hours later reflect a positive outcome for the treatment intervention? Select all that apply. Now, this is the kind of question you could get as a standalone next-gen question. So normally you don't get this much information um, on NCLEX questions, but this could be like a standalone because they are very interested in you being able to identify trends. And you, you need to know, is the trend showing improvement, uh, getting worse, or staying the same? So in this case, what they're saying is which ones are getting better. So we had a temp of 100.2. Now, that's tympanic. Tympanic temperatures tend to run lower. So I know we can go up to 100.4 and it's still considered normal. But um, this is a 52-year-old woman. We, I don't know what her baseline is, but she started out at 100.2 and now she's 98.6. So I say that looks like it's getting better. And we're looking for the ones that reflect a positive outcome. Okay. So we're going to say that temp is actually getting better. Heart rate went from 112 to 98. So they were tachycardic and now they're normal. So we're going to say that's improving. Respiratory rate was 22, which was high. And now it's 18. So it went from high to normal. So that's fine. It's getting better. Now the blood pressure was 138 over 86. So that's prehypertension. And now it's 134 over 80. And that's still prehypertension. So we're actually going to have to say that that didn't change. We're going to say the blood pressure didn't change. So that's not necessarily a positive outcome. The O2 set went from 92%, which is low. It's under 93% to 96%. And so that is an improvement. So, and sorry, I changed it on one slide and didn't change it on the other. So I changed it 95 and forgot to change it on the other. It doesn't matter. It's still an improvement. Okay. So this is how you look at trends. Now I would have, I think I would have preferred to see the temp start out at 100.6 because on the NCLEX, if it starts out within normal limits and it ends it within normal limits, it's staying the same, even if it's changed. So I would have preferred to actually say like it was 100.6. The reason I was okay with 100.2 being outside of normal limits is because it was tympanic and tympanic temperatures run lower. And I know 100.4 is the high end of normal for oral. So I'm okay that 100.2 tympanic is too high because that's that's not really expected when you're doing a tympanic temperature. All right. The MP LPN provides the RN with a shift handoff vital signs on four patients. Prioritize in order the follow-up patient assessments to be made. Okay. 84 year old client. Uh, so when you read these, when they say prioritize, ignore the age and the gender, they do not matter. Okay. Do not even take the age into consideration. And they often don't give you the gender anymore. They just say a client. So 84 year old client recently admitted with pneumonia, respiratory rate of 28, which is high and SPO2 of 85%, which is low. 54 year old client admitted after surgery for a repair of fractured arm. Blood pressure is high hypertensive, and the heart rate is normal. 63-year-old uh, client with venous ulcers from diabetes, the temp is normal, and the heart rate is normal. 77-year-old client with left mastectomy, 36 hours ago, temp is high, heart rate is high, respiratory rate is high, and blood pressure is high. Okay, so the, the ones with the most significant changes in vital signs are A and D. B has abnormal vital signs, but it's the blood just the blood pressure. And A and D have the most serious changes in vital signs. So the question is, am I more concerned about an SPO2 of 85% or, and with a respiratory rate of 28, or about someone whose temp is up, heart rate's up, respiratory rate's up, and blood pressure's up. So here's the rule. When you have two objective findings, two objective findings, they're both abnormal, and ABCs work, go with ABCs. ABCs doesn't work all the time, but when you have two objective findings, they're both abnormal and unexpected, uh, go with the ABCs. Now, if ABCs doesn't work, like let's say one person has uh, diarrhea and the other person is malnourished, okay? Those are 
actual problems. Uh, neither one of them is not ABCs, right? So you have to go with acute over chronic. So acute's worse than chronic. But in this case, we can go with ABCs works. So I'm going to have to say A is more serious than B, even though B is, or D, A is more serious than D, even though D is significant. It's, I, I have, using my ABCs, I'm going to say A is more serious than D. So A is number one, D is number two. Now C has everything normal. So C is going to be my last one. So B has an abnormal blood pressure. So I'm going to go A, D, B, and then C. So that's how I make my decisions related to vital signs. And this is, um, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good question. And you should, I, I hope you paid attention to how I, I told you to answer that because that will help you when you have to prioritize. All right. A patient has been hospitalized for the past 48 hours with a fever of unknown origin. His medical record indicates the following temps. So 4101.6, which is high, 897.9 normal, 1298.4 normal, 1699.6 normal, 2000.9, which is high. And I'm going to, I'm going to assume they're oral. Um, so we've got two that are high and three that are normal. How would this nurse describe this pattern of temperature measurement? Usual range of circadian rhythm measurements, sustained fe fever pattern, intermittent fever pattern, or resolving fever pattern. Well, I'm going to cross off sustained fever pattern because it's clearly not a sustained fever pattern. Um, it's not a resolving fever pattern because we start out with a high and we end with a high. So it's not B and it's not C or D. It's not B and it's not D. So is it an intermittent fever pattern? Well, it definitely is an intermittent fever pattern because we have high at four and high at 20 hundred. Now, is this circadian rhythm measurements? Is this what I would expect from circadian rhythms? It's not because I expect the lowest number to be at between four and six, you know, somewhere in there. So I would expect if it was a normal circadian rhythm, I would expect that four o'clock to be very low and it's not. So I have to say this is an intermittent fever pattern. Which of the following patients are at most risk for tachypnea? Now, tachypnea means increased respiratory rate, increased respiratory rate, so over 20. Patient just admitted with four rib fractures, woman who is nine months pregnant, a patient admitted with hypothermia, post-op patient waking from general anesthesia, three-pack per day smoker with pneumonia. All right, someone admitted with four rib fractures, uh, would they be increased risk for tachypnea? So people with rib fractures tend to have fast, shallow respiration. So I'm going to say A is likely to have tachypnea. It's going to be shallow, but it's still going to be fast. So I'm going to say A for sure. Woman who's nine months pregnant. Well, when you're nine months pregnant, you have faster, shallower respirations because the baby's pushing on the diaphragm. So it's harder to take a deep breath. So we often they often increase respiratory rate while it's still kind of shallow. So B is definitely tachypnea. A patient admitted with hypothermia. So do you remember the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve? Hypothermia causes a shift to the left and it releases oxygen more slowly to the tissues because the tissues are not demanding oxygen. So you can actually have a lower partial pressure of oxygen and still have an adequate O2 sat. So I would think someone who's hypothermic respiratory rate would actually go down because they're demanding less oxygen. So I'm going to say no to C. D, post-op patient waking from general anesthesia. Well, general anesthesia in general slows everything down anyway. So I would think their respiratory rate would be slower, but also their body temperature is lower. So they're going to be hypothermic. So they're demanding less oxygen. So I would not expect their respiratory rate to be high. So I'm going to know C and D or no, a three pack per day smoker with pneumonia. Okay. Are they trying to kill them? Three pack per day? Goodness gracious. All right. So I would definitely say a three pack per day smoker with pneumonia is going to have increased respiratory rate. So those are the correct answers on that. All right. Eight? What the heck? How did I get an eight? The nurse understands that when, which statement is correct regarding respiratory rates. Infants have a lower respiratory rate than adults. That's absolutely false. Healthy adults breathe between 12 and 20 times a minute. True. A compensatory response to a fever is to breathe at a slower rate. That's false because you shift to the right and your higher metabolic rate demands more oxygen. So your respiratory rate actually go up because you need more oxygen. So that C is false. An increase in intracranial pressure results in an increased respiratory rate. So let's say we don't know the answer to that. 
And we go, well, I don't know. So here's the rule. You never pick the answer you're not sure about over the answer you are sure about, y'all. You know B is correct. You know it's correct. Okay, don't be picking D just because you're not sure about it. In fact, it's it's false because it's uh, it actually decreases respiratory rate. But um, you know B is correct. So pick B, y'all. Okay. All right. Oh, I have one more. I thought that was it. Okay. It's 6 a.m. and the UAP reports to the nurse that the patient has a temperature of 96.7 tympanic, which factor explains this reading. 6 a.m. tympanic. So that's pretty low. The patient's room is cold. Maybe the patient was drinking cold water. Well, it's tympanic. So no, if it was oral, maybe, but no, if not, if they're drinking cold water, the patient exhibiting a normal circadian rhythm. Yes, because it's lower in the morning. The patient just completed a warm shower. Well, no, that doesn't make any sense. So it could either be A or C. And because it's 6 a.m. and the circadian rhythms I know are lower in the morning, then C has to be the right answer. All right. I hope you found that interesting. I thought it was super interesting. Uh Hey, I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I'll see if my grandkids want to come over to play with the toys I spent all morning putting together. Okay, have a great rest of your day. Good luck.